I'm here today, as all of you are, to celebrate and talk about David Marshall. When I was first approached to write the biography of David Marshall, I said to David, I am not going to do a commission biography, but you're exactly the sort of subject I would want to write about as a biography because he was a wonderful character, he was colorful, he was flamboyant, and I knew I could say anything about David and he wouldn't come back at me. And that's a good way to start. And so A Sensation of Independence was written. I think it's objective but sympathetic. David Marshall said, you called me a political virgin. That was his main comment. The, but uh, here I am today to talk to you about his political role. Now, when thinking about political leadership, it is useful to think of <clears throat> the stage a country is going through in its political life. This is because leaders and leadership cannot be thought about and evaluated out of its context. I've just come from the United States, where election primaries are being hard fought. The choice of the next political leader, the President of the United States, is defined by one party and possibly for the presidential election as a choice between opting for change and opting for experience. For Americans, it really depends on who you are, how old you are, your income level, and whether you think the country is at the watershed of history and what stage of history. In the life of a nation, there are phases for most new states, and these are generally marked by, firstly, the past. Secondly, the nationalist awakening, the anti-colonial phase. Thirdly, the nation-building phase. The, fourthly, the maintenance of stability and equilibrium. If you're lucky, you get to that stage. And fifthly, meeting new challenges and crises in the post-success stage. You can, of course, see some countries never get beyond nation building or the maintenance of stability, but never quite breaking through it. So I would ask, to think, ask you to think of Singapore at each of these stages. Today, we're here to remember Marshall, David Marshall, celebrate and assess the life and his contributions. David Marshall was, was most active politically in the nationalist awakening and colonial phase of Singapore's history. His political role continued into the nation-building phase of Singapore. He turned diplomat at the time when Singapore was entering its stable state of affluence. He died on December 12, 1995. When I wrote my biography, I began by saying, in April 1955, David Marshall came into Singapore politics like a shooting star, and like a shooting star, filled the sky with brilliance and disappeared. For 14 months, he was the first chief minister of Singapore under the Rendell Constitution. He was a man who tried to shake the average man and woman in Singapore to arouse them to aspire uh, to, uh, to and to join him in the struggle for independence, to push back British colonialism. He was a man who led the first constitutional talks of Singapore with the British for independence. But he was not the only player, and I think that's important to remember. There were others. Lee Kuan Yew, Lim Yew Hock, Lim Chin Siong were active too, representing different positions on the political spectrum. There was the MCP, Malayan Communist Party, lurking underground, and the trade unions. In the end, he was not the one who concluded the constitutional talks, nor was he the one who presided over the independence of Singapore. Now, you may ask, in Singapore, where the contemporary and recent political history of the island is dominated by the achievements of the People's Action Party and Lee Kuan Yew and his team, how is one to assess a man like David Marshall and understand his role in the development and political process of Singapore? And how do I assess him 25 years 
after I wrote the biography. I would suggest that we think of David Marshall in two aspects. Firstly, of his contributions as an early nationalist leader, initiating the fight for independence, mobilizing the people of Singapore in the anti-colonial phase. And secondly, as a man who tried to advocate and insert liberal democratic values, the Queensbury rules which he believed in, into the emerging political process and the discourse of a new nation. This second aspect of him was a role he embodied, he embodied until his death. Now let me very quickly run through the developments in his life because it is important. You get a sense of the man's personality, you understand why he is so international, why he's such a cosmopolitan, and why he has the values he has. Uh, Tommy Cole and the others have, and the Chief Justice have mentioned, you know, his, uh, of David Marshall as a man and David Marshall as a lawyer. David Marshall was born on Mar March 12, 1908 a hundred years ago today, to Saul Nassi Marshall and Faha Marshall in a house in Saligi Road. His parents were Baghdadi Jews, and his father came to Singapore following the example of Manasseh Maya, who left Mesopotamia, as Iraq was then called, to make his fortune in the East. Now, very few people realize that as a child, Marshall spent three years from 1914 to 1917 in Iraq when his mother visited her family and got caught up in the Turco-British fight for the control of Baghdad and Iraq. He couldn't leave. Well, when he left in 1917, he returned to Singapore, started school at the Convent of the Holy Infant Jesus in the kindergarten, and went on to St. Joseph's and finally St. Andrew's. He transferred to Raffles Institution at Standard 7 and finished there. Now, even in school, and there are you know, stories of his encountering the British colonial treatment, and he noticed the differences in treatment between British teachers, colonial teachers, and those who were local teachers. And it uh, gave him an awareness of what it was to live under colonial rule. He was taking his exams for the Queen's Scholarship when he collapsed and spent some time recovering in Arosa. George Olas won the Queen's Scholarship instead. He went to Arosa, Switzerland. When Marshall returned to Singapore at this time, it was 1930, and he started working for a commercial firm. But his first thought was he wanted to study medicine. It wasn't law, but he didn't do it in the end, and that's a long story. Instead, he arrived in London in 1934, enrolled in the Middle Temple to do law. He returned to Singapore in 1937. Sorry, he went in 1934 to the Middle Temple. And in 1937, he returned to Singapore to become the 95th person to register as an advocate and solicitor since Song Ong Siang in 1894. Now, David Marshall was working in the firm of Aitken and Ong, when war broke out in Europe and the Japanese threat to Southeast Asia was a distinct possibility. He joined the Singapore Volunteers Corps in B Company, was taken POW, as Tommy said, uh, by the Japanese. He wasn't sent to the death railway. He was luckier. He was sent to Japan, to Hokkaido, to Nitsi Atsibetsu, where he worked on the coal mines. But he was so weak in the end, they took him out of the mines and he was used to move iron ore, which was brought from Manchuria to Japan. And he was a laborer moving things around. Um, returning to Singapore in 1946, and that was the end of the war, he went back to study law. And like all educated local professionals of the day, began to go back into their careers. He was slower in getting into the immediate post-war politics, unlike Gerald D. Cruz or Philip Hua Lim, and did not get involved in the Malayan Democratic Union, which was like one of the first parties to be formed. True to say, Marshall was not politicized at that time. He did not mix with the anti-colonial Asian and African leaders when he was studying law in London, and 